So this is our second lecture and today in gas power cycles today I'd like to go through a uh, little more on internal combustion engines and try to wrap up the auto cycle. Next time we'll get into diesel. So one thing is I talked about the engine displacements last time. Some people said, oh, I have a 3.8 liter engine. This is one that's uh, in the vehicle that I own. It's a Buick, uh, in a lot of Buicks, there's a 3,800. It's a 3.8 liter. What exactly is that? It's the engine displacement volume. So what, how do you calculate it? You would first calculate the cylinder displacement volume and then multiply by the number of cylinders. So if you have six cylinders, unless it's a weird engine, they all have the same uh, displacement volume. I'm not saying you couldn't have a weird engine, but most of them have the same per cylinder. So you find out what the bore is, the bore. You find out what the stroke is, the stroke. And then the, 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 uh, the clearance volume, the, I'm sorry, the displacement volume would be pi bore squared over 4. Isn't that the area? Pi r squared or pi b squared over 4. And then you multiply that by the stroke and doesn't get, give you the volume. And then if you multiply for one cylinder by the number of cylinders, you get the engine displacement volume. So, okay. Uh, does the clearance volume come into play? That's this volume, which is at the top dead center. So the volume at top dead center is the clearance volume. No, it's, it's the displacement volume. What happens is the uh, clearance volume, um, it's like your compression ratio, R, is the, the volume that's at uh, bottom dead center divided by the volume at top dead center. And so the volume at bottom dead center is the uh, displacement plus the clearance divided by the volume clearance. I tried to color code those. So this volume right here is the displacement volume on that one cylinder. And this volume right here is the clearance volume. So all of it. Let's say you have a 10 to 1 compression ratio engine. Uh, it get the 10, whatever it is, cubic centimeters, liter, milliliters, gets squeezed into uh, that final volume. All right. Uh, we're also going to talk about the mean effective pressure. Uh, this is an elusive concept. It's difficult to grasp for a lot of students, but I think this is the best explanation I've come up with. Think of a PV diagram and you put on three PV diagrams atmospheric pressure. And then you trace out the pressure volume curve of an actual uh, gasoline engine. All right. Remember we started at uh, top, uh, uh, sorry, bottom dead center where you have the largest volume and then you went through compression some ignition, high pressure coming up rapidly. And then you went through some power stroke. Then you had some blow down. And then you had some exhaust stroke and then intake stroke and that. And if somebody says, what's the power for one whole cycle, you would t take and just do the boundary work for each of these strokes. So the area under this curve would be work in in the power stroke. The area under this curve all the way up in here will be the work out for the power stroke and then the difference in those two areas is this hashed area which is a positive work out. If you want to do the same thing you find that there's a work in during the exhaust stroke it's small but it's still work in and there's also a negative work so anyway there's this whole area right here is is a uh, it's not expanding at high pressure it's actually expanding at lower pressure than which it is so this is an also a neg this is not a positive area but it's a negative uh, sort of pumping of the fluid throwing it out and then ingesting so if you took the positive area and added to it the negative area or subtracted whatever the sign convention you have, that would be the net work, W net, of that cycle. Thumbs up if you followed that.
Good. Let's do the simplification. So here we are. We start at state one around atmospheric pressure with the auto cycle. We compress. We add heat. We expand. We reject heat. So we go for state one, two, three, four. What would be the work net of the cycle? Well, it's the same thing. During this stroke, this is the compression stroke. This is like a negative work and it's visually represented by the area under the curve. Then during the power stroke, this is a positive work represented by the area under the curve. So the net for the cycle would be the enclosed area, and that's your work net. So if you want a larger work net per cycle, try to make that area large. Well, that was a simplification. Wasn't the auto cycle a very simple, abstract idealization of the real cycle? It's useful, but you can even do this. And this is what engineers are good at. If you're not good at this, try to get good at it. Extreme simplification, which is, huh, how can I really make this easy? Well, I'm interested in getting the area of the curve. And what is the easiest area of a curve. What type of curve do you like? Straight line. Straight line. If I just gave me the final exam in Cal 1 and said, give me you know, the integral, or Cal 2, I guess that's when they do integrals, you would love it. So take that and you just do this. You're just going to go with this is the cycle. You're going to compress, add heat, expand, and now what do you have? You have this very simple rectangle. And what do we have? In all of these cases on the x-axis, it's the displacement volume. It's that specific volume at bottom dead center, the specific volume at top dead center, the specific volume displacement, that's how many cubic meter displacement per kilogram, is equal to V of the bottom dead center minus the V of top dead center. The same thing over here. This difference is the displacement volume. This is the specific displacement volume. Okay, well, right here, if you knew that pressure, you would just, the work net would be a simple multiplication. Wouldn't it be work net equal to that pressure times V displacement? Chase my units here. What are the preferred units for this lowercase w net? Kilojoules per kilogram. It's a specific work. That's right. And this volume, meter cubed per kilogram, and this is going to be a pressure, like a kilopascal, right? So a pressure in the units, of, let's say, kilopascal. Well, this is what they call the mean effective pressure. It's the mean effective pressure. It's one pressure which represents the average difference between the compression pressure and the expansion pressure. That's the mean effective pressure. So a lot of times you'll see, oh, the definition of the mean effective pressure is work net divided by the volume displacement. Let's say you didn't want it on a per unit mass basis, fine. Make this cap W net, okay, and then have cap volume displacement. But most of the time we work in specific work and specific volumes. Does that help on mean effective pressure? Good. Let's press forward. Let's solve a problem. The problem is long, so I'll only give you the first two parts, part A and B. We have other parts on the next slide. We have an air standard auto cycle. As soon as you see air standard, there's a number of things. Air only, I don't have exhaust and intake, the heat transfer replaces combustion, heat transfer replaces the exhaust stroke and intake stroke. Okay. It's an auto cycle, so heat addition at constant volume. Right away, you can probably sketch both the pressure volume diagram, one to two to three to four to one. So we'll state one, two, three, four. The standard for our auto cycle, as well as a temperature entropy diagram, one to two to three to four, back and forth, one, two, three, four. True? Okay. 
It uh, operates with the temperature of 300 Kelvin and pressure of 95 kilopascal at the start of the compression stroke. What did they just give us with that temperature and pressure? They gave us this. This is T1 and this is P1. State 1 is the beginning of the compression stroke. This is the compression stroke from 1 to 2. Okay. The compression ratio is given to be 10.5. The symbol used for compression ratio is R. And it's the specific volume initial state one minus or divided by the specific volume final. Is that our definition of compression ratio? You agree? Or should it be the reciprocal of that? Well, in the interest of time, I'm encouraging you to, you know, engage when I talk through lectures because I do have a lot of errors in my lectures. And I think this is right. Do you agree? I'm not getting enough thumbs up. That means you're not following me. Are you following me? Do you agree? All right. Now you have the maximum temperature of the cycle is 1800 Kelvin. Because of the temperature entropy diagram, I know what state has the maximum temperature. Is it state one, two, three, or four? State three. So they gave us T3. That's right there, T3. Consider constant specific heats evaluated at 300 Kelvin. That's a very loaded statement right there. They're telling you how to analyze this cycle. How are you going to analyze it? Using constant specific heats for air. And just go get it. It's a cold air standard analysis. That's what we're doing. Go get it at 300 Kelvin. All right. Then they ask you to determine the temperature at the end of the compression stroke. What state is at the end of the compression stroke? Two, so it's T2. Here's the answer. It's 768 Kelvin. How do we calculate that answer? What is the method to get T2? Well, we know that during the compression from 1 to 2, what is constant? S is constant. It's isentropic <coughs> compression. How did we get isentropic compression? It's adiabatic, no heat transfer, and it's internally reversible. Put them together in the second law, it's isentropic. It's air undergoing isentropic compression, and you have constant specific heats. It jogs your memory. You think back to Thermo 1. You think back to all that entropy uh, chapter. And you can recall equations like this. These are very loaded equations. If you misuse them, you know, you don't get a lot of you know, benefit. It's for S1 equal to S2, isentropic, for an ideal gas with constant specific heats. And I could use either this form, this form, or this form. And we could go back and review the derivation, but maybe not right now. I did it at, earlier at 9 o'clock, and it delayed me. I didn't get as far as I wanted to in the lecture by doing that. So uh, this, this is in Chapter 6. How many people have already had to go back and review some material in 3, some material in 6? Absolutely. If your hand didn't go up... Uh, Maybe next semester you'll get another chance. No, you need the review. You need the review. Come on. Okay? So uh, the equation that we're going to use if we're interested in T2 at the end of a compression stroke, and we know the compression ratio, this is our equation that we'd like to use. So we go to table A20, and you can pick off for error, the C sub P, C sub V, as well as K. What was the definition of this K? Is it just C sub P divided by C sub V? Yeah, that's all it is. And so that's the K that goes right in here, the ratio of specific heats. So now we can come back and you say, okay, so T2 is equal to T1 times the compression ratio raised to the K minus 1. We put in our 10.5, our 1.4, and our initial temperature of 300 Kelvin, and that's how you calculate this temperature. Uh, 
if uh, somebody said it starts at 25 degrees C, can you put 25 in there for T1? No. no. It has to be an absolute temperature. All right. So let's continue on. What about the peak pressure? Well, where is the peak pressure? What state? Is it P1, P2, P3, P4 that we're asked to solve for? P3. That's exactly right. Some people calculate P2, box it, and say, there's my peak pressure. But no. So how do I calculate the peak pressure? First, you calculate P2. And then you use that to calculate the, the final pressure. So let's take a look. Here is another relationship. Notice if you'll see the pattern, we're going to use these two relationships in the Otto and in the diesel cycle. And we're going to use this relationship a lot in the Brayton cycle. So for right now, when we're doing Otto and diesel, we kind of leave this one alone. But uh, this is the one that we need to use. And so what we find is P2 is equal to P1 times the compression ratio raised to the K power. That gives us P2. How do I get P3? It's always an ideal gas. And so our ideal gas is PV is equal to RT, so that PV divided by T is always equal to R, no matter if it's at state 2 or state 3. And what is the relationship between V2 and V3, they're the same, so they can cancel. And that you get that uh, P3 is equal to P2 times T3 divided by T2. Does that look doable? So you get this pressure for the peak pressure. Ready to press forward? What do you think? After this, the pattern that we tried to emphasize when you're doing uh, rank and power, vapor power cycles, get some diagram, temperature entropy. Here we get temperature entropy, pressure, volume for the auto cycle. Get a table of first what? Props. And then get a table of transfers, the Qs and the Ws for the processes 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1, and do the net. That's the same pattern. We're going to do it right here for the auto and the diesel cycle. So for the properties, we're interested in pressure, temperature. If you want specific volume, you want internal energy, you want some other ones, you can list them. But for this problem, if you're using constant specific heats, the big ones are just pressure and temperature. You really don't even need specific volume internal energies. But you need it at state 1, state 2, state 3, state 4, and you just walk through to populate that property table. Well, here is in Excel, we put the compression ratio, C sub V, C sub P. We put um, K, and again, I didn't fix that error. It's R, not R bar. What is this R right here? R is equal to R bar divided by the molar mass. And for air, 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin is R. Okay, so we work through moving from known pressure, temperature, and known temperature. We can populate the rest of those temperatures and pressures. We have our property table, and those two values we already talked about calculating. The next part, C, what is the heat addition for the cycle? This is the answer. It's around 740 uh, kilojoules per kilogram. How do I calculate the heat addition for the cycle? Should I pause, let you solve for it? I got to stop, pause. All right, so we do the first law for the process. Two to three, you're going to need the first law for each of these processes. But if you're asked for getting the heat in, you know the heat in is only from two to three. And so it's going to be U3 minus U2 is equal to Q2 to three, what we're looking for, minus work two to three. That's zero because there's no expansion, boundary work. And then we replace C sub V 
T3 minus T2 because we're using constant specific heats and it's an ideal gas. And there you go. Now you had those two temperatures. You had temperature at 3 and you had the temperature at 2 and you had the specific heat, C sub V, you calculate that heat in. How about for part D? What is the net work for the cycle? Well, it's a little bit more work. I can't do it in one equation. Best thing is go ahead and populate that whole table of Q's and W's for the process 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1. Half of the table is full of zeros, isn't it? And then when you sum, you'll get W net as well as Q net. And if they are not the same, look for your error. Look for your error. But this is what they were asking for. And that's going to be the sum of a positive expansion work from 3 to 4. The work 3 to 4 is positive. Plus the work uh, 1 to 2 is negative. And so those two. All right. You got that? Roughly, what is the equation for work 1 to 2? Can, I'm going to pause, walk around. I want you to show me the work. All right, you write the first law of thermodynamics for the process 1 to 2. So don't forget that. Process 1 to 2, you have U2 minus U1 is equal to Q1 to 2 in minus work 1 to 2. This process is adiabatic. Hence, the work 1 to 2 is equal to U1 minus U2, which is C sub V T1 minus T2. Correct or not correct? It's correct. And T2 is greater than T1, so you're going to get a negative work, 1 to 2. And so that comes in at 451.5. You want to do it by the integral of PDV? You, you can, but um, it's so much easier just to do it by the first law. And if you want, maybe we'd later go back and revisit the longer approach. It's like, can I leave San Antonio and drive to Houston by going through El Paso? Yes, you can. <laughs> but why would we want to when you can just get on I-10 and drive straight to Houston? So, I, okay. So... Basically, you have a table of your states. You have a table of all your processes. Half of the table is full of zeros, which makes it easier. And each one of these is solved for using first law of thermodynamics for each of these four processes. You add it up. You get the Q net. You add it up, the column. You get the work net. And they need to match. They must match or we have an error. The next question, what is the thermal efficiency of this cycle? Well, what is the thermal efficiency defined as? Work net out divided by the Q provided in. So this is the work net out divided by Q, 2 to 3. So it's uh, 451.5 kilojoules per kilogram divided by 740.7. Right, we're picking off this value for work net, that for Q in, and there's your answer, 61%. The last one, what is the mean effective pressure? The mean effective pressure, work net divided by V displacement. All right, but how do I get that displacement volume? Would that be V? 1 minus V2. And so if I know the pressure and the temperature, I can get that V1, right? And then the same with V2. You get the difference. You get the displacement volume. Here I show you the displacement volume. I calculated the Vs at each of the states and did it uh, by the difference. And then I divide them, and you get the, the uh, mean effective pressure, 551 kilopascal. All right. We sketched that pressure volume diagram, and everybody sketches it like that. True? And it is an illustration. How close is it to the real PV diagram? 
What do you think? This is, this is real data plotted here for our ideal auto cycle PV diagram. Does it look the same? So what it is, is it's surprisingly that the pressure doesn't really increase dramatically until you get near the end of the compression, then it really is skyrocketing. That's why if you do have a little change in compression ratio, it really goes up. Can you see that? Yeah. Increasing the compression ratio, meaning it goes to a smaller volume, would really get the pressure a lot higher and the temperature a lot higher at state two. Now, this is some heat addition for our problem where we said, hey, the temperature goes up to, what did I pick, 1,800? I can't remember. Almost 6,000 kilopascal. And then it dramatically drops as you're expanding it. And then right here, you would say, that doesn't look like a significant pressure difference at the end between four and one, but it's enough. Okay. What is the pressure at four? It's uh, 222, and this is 95. So it's like a little over 200, let's say 220, and around 100. I changed the problem. Uh, it replaces the constant specific heat with variable specific heat. How do you solve a problem if it says... It's now treated as variable specific. Well, to solve this problem, I'm first going to point out you will get different answers. This is constant. This is the new answer. All right. This, this answer for part B is the same exact value, but the value for part C, heat addition, is different. And the network is different. And the thermal efficiency is different. So, yes, you do get different numbers and they are not in agreement to two significant figures in general. They're, they're, they're pretty different, right? Students always ask me, which one is the better answer? Which one's the more exact answer? Well, first of all, it's the auto cycle. It's already an abstraction of the real cycle. So getting in the ballpark is pretty good. But if you're saying how ac which is most accurate for the true auto cycle, well, it would be for variable specific heats. Okay. So this would be the more accurate. Which one's more preferred in exams and other things? Well, what you find is when you use variable specific heats, you have to interpolate. Does interpolation take time? On a time-limited exam, do you want to spend time interpolating? So often on my exams, I say here are some constant values for specific heats solve it using that because I don't have enough time to allow you to do it with the variable. But there's a lot, half of the homework problems are so use, require you use variable specific heats. So what information do you need to call back from chapter six, recall from chapter six? You have to go and recall how to use this table A22 and especially this part of the table A22 and the funny thing about it, it has a temperature goes down, then the temperature wraps around and continues down. So it's, it's like a, <coughs> this section right here is for air undergoing an isentropic process. And in that, you get some new variables, PR and VR. These do not have a name. There's no name for PR and VR. You're saying, I think I've seen PR before, and isn't that the pressure divided by the critical point pressure? That's the reduced pressure. That has a name. That's used in the compressibility chart. That's used to distinguish between an ideal gas and a real gas. That's covered in Chapter 3. But this is a cap R subscript. This is a lowercase r subscript. That is not the reduced pressure. Likewise, TR is the reduced temperature, the actual temperature over the critical point temperature. That's a little aside, don't get confused. But how do you use it? Well, they would say, when you have air only and you're undergoing an isentropic process, the ratio of these no-name piece of R's between state one and two is the same as the ratio of the actual pressures. How many people solved the problem using this? The rest of the hands are saying, I'm going to go review it. And that's in here, chapter 6. These are the two equations for your review. And then likewise, you can have volume. Sometimes we know volume changes. Auto diesel, guess what we know? 
compression ratio, often volume changes. Hence, this is the preferred. But when we get to the Brayton, if you wanted to do, you would, this would, the other one would be preferred, okay, because we're going to know pressures. All right. So how do we do that? Let me kind of go over here. And what you would say is you're going from state one where you know T1. Well, you go to the table. Here is your temperature one. You can read across and find VR1. That's VR1. And then you use this equation right here. You say, well, V2 divided by V1. Hey, that's one over the compression ratio, which is 10.5 for this problem is equal to VR2 divided by VR1. I just looked up VR1 as a function of temperature only. There it is. The only unknown in this is VR2. I calculate my new VR2. I go back into the table. Lo and behold, maybe it's over here somewhere. And I may have to interpolate to find T2. But more importantly, I'm interested in U2. See that? Just like at 300, this is U1, internal energy at state 1. All right? So you spend a lot of time in these tables. You get the V sub R. You divide it by the compression ratio to get a new V sub R. You then look up the new temperature and especially the new internal energy. Now, from state 2 to 3 is not isentropic. It's the same process as what you had before. You just are adding heat and you're boosting to a known final temperature. So basically, at this temperature, you go look up V sub R and U. And now you know you're going to go from 3 to 4 isentropic expansion. It's like 1 over the compression ratio. That's the expansion ratio. And so you take that V sub R at 3, multiply by the compression ratio, that's V sub R at 4. Now you look up the temperature at 4 if you wanted to know it, but really you want the U at 4, the internal energy at 4. Then once you have this different, you know, the big difference is you looked up these U's. Now it's the same thing to calculate the uh, work transfers and heat transfers for the processes. Here, it's going to be the difference between these two U's. This one's the difference between those two U's, right? U3 minus U2. All right. Nothing's really changed in the first in law. It's just how you got the change in U's. Instead of using C sub V delta T, you use the table values. And then you can update your calculations of thermal efficiency and the mean effective pressure. You should solve the problem both ways. All right. Well, there's a simple equation for the auto cycle thermal efficiency. The thermal efficiency of the auto cycle turns out to be 1 minus 1 over the compression ratio to the K minus 1 power. OK. This uh, I derived a number of semesters ago. It's derived in the textbook or give it enough information how to do the derivation. I encourage you to take a look at it. But one of the interesting things is, is the thermal efficiency of the auto cycle as a function of the compression ratio goes up. Well, let me talk quickly about the octane number. How many people have ever seen one of these and purchased gasoline? And then you're left with the dilemma, which one do, what button do I push? Right? <laughs> and how many people always just push the cheapest? Yeah, you got like most of us. Well, this really you're paying for octane. It's a resistance to knock. That's what it is, self-ignition. So I encourage you to know a little bit more about this premature combustion. But as the piston gets near the top, if you have a problem with knock before or when the spark plug fires, it'll create a higher pressure range. And maybe there's a hot spot where little carbon deposits are, and it'll start combustion over there. Or maybe over here, it'll start combustion. Now you have pressure pulses coming into it. They knock against each other, and it's very audible and damaging to your engines. There's my 60 second on premature combustion and knock. So you combat it by having higher anti-knock or octane rating for your fuel. If you buy an expensive car like this, they, you look in the manual, 
And they will tell you, oh, you need premium unleaded gasoline. That's why they sell different blends. But most cars on the road don't require premium. This car does, but guess what? If you own it, you can afford it. <laughs> so this, it's a 91 octane minimum, all right? So how many people know they have to put above the 91 oct or 80, whatever, seven? You have to put more, true? And you have to pay for it. It can be an unpleasant experience. Well, there was recently, very recently, a AAA um, report that went out and said that people pet the dashes of their car, they name their cars, they buy themselves special beverages for the weekends, they buy their cars special beverages for the weekend, they fill them up with high octane, thinking they're treating their car better. You may have done that, but guess what? It makes no sense to the engineer who knows what they're buying. So. I encourage you to take a look at this article. If you don't need it, don't buy it. There's not a higher energy content. There will not be a higher MPG. If you do need it, you must buy it. All right. With that, I'm done for today. Thank you for your attention.